The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to Talk Cosmos, the show where Sue Rose Minahan and guests unveil astrology's ancient archetypes that continually build the collective experiences in our unconsciousness. Get ready to find your free will from your roots in the stars. Hello, everybody. This is Talk Cosmos, Saturday, the 12th of May. And the highlight, really, we must jump right directly to the fact that our outer planet, the great Uranus, beyond the structure of Saturn that is visible to the eye, is changing into its next sign, which happens to be the sign that we're talking about today, again, in another dimension, Taurus. It's been in Aries for seven years, since 2010, the energy of motion direction. Now, energy, Taurus, as energy never dissipates, it only, or destroys, it only recreates, it reforms. And that energy of Taurus, as spirit wants to find form. So here we have a rawness representing the god of the sky in Greek mythology and Roman mythology of the entirety coming to earth because Taurus represents earth. It is an earth sign. It's a fixed sign. It's the element, the second element of fixity. Fixity, yes. And it's ruled by Venus, the goddess of love, love that incorporates the intention of thought, the intention of action into compassion and that which serves others rather than just yourself. So as this flash of Uranus, because Uranus also, as a planet, rules Aquarius, generally speaking, and it is the awakener. It is that energy that brings us to our authenticity, higher octave of Mercury in relationship, but it's a mental mentality. It's represented right now, you might say, in Hawaii, where I am. That's why I'm Skyping in from Hawaii, the big island, beautiful island today, too, as Kilo. Kilauea, the volcano is erupting, wanting, one wonders, another crater. Essentially, this earth, our very primal essence, coming back into the land, making new land. So today's focus is generally on this entire realm. There's many talks about it. Today I will be introducing a speaker who's uh, June Rose Trimbach. She's not here at presently, will be in a little bit. And June is an astrologer and healer. She uses ancient cosmology, awakening connections to the spiritual. She has consultations, healing work, privately groups, teaches, and also hosts Hollow Earth Radio and does oracular ceremonies just to identify her as she enters. The earth right now in so many avenues, the subject is coming up, I find, on television shows like this one about six stages of our earth that started with volcanic you know, ash coming out of the earth. And then as it hardened into granite, a gray color, interestingly, it went into color. Because Taurus, remember, is senses. It's our body. It's our very being. It's that energy in this form. And we use these resources of our very self, our sight, our hearing, our eyes. And so even the earth, as it manifested, has these 
color stages that were presented on PBS just a few nights ago. Black was the first color as the lava was coming forth, just like it is on Kilauea. Now, Pele, who is the goddess here on Hawaii with the volcano, going to gray of granite, going to water of blue, where they think earth life actually may have started, not up on the light, but down in the depths of the ocean, creating the green that went through various cycles till the, with the ice age and eventually went to the earth that we revere and love now. So what are the values? That really is essential. When you look back in time, because this is a long uh, Taurus in, uh, Uranus has an 84 year cycle, 84 year cycle. And so if you go back, it relates to the French, it was founded, pardon me, in 1781, when the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, the American Revolution was occurring. It's all land-based and money-based resources. And the question might be now, because, it, okay, the question is now, where do you put your money? Where are our values? Is it just with the material? Because the spirit, it is spirit manifested into form. The relationship between Venus, which rules Taurus, and the Earth, as Rick Levine gave a wonderful speech about and is a great spokesman for quintiles, is a, which is a different aspect. This is astrology speaking, but if you divide it by five, you get 72 degrees. Interestingly, if you look at that number, we have about 72% water to, to our personal body, same as Earth. So this 72 ratio is also divided mathematically, if you are interested, from Venus's orbit around Earth with, oh, not around Earth, around the sun with Earth's orbit, which comes to the golden ratio, which happens to be of 1.6. Two, eight, and it goes on forever. It never ends. That's not an exact number. But the point is, it's roughly this golden ratio that Da Vinci, so many artists, and it's shown in spirals. It's really the bedrock of the environment, our entire galaxy. And it essentially is a pentagram, which also represents the Venus points, because Venus goes has an eight-year cycle, and it goes through five points consistently, just shifting a degree at a time. There's cycles and cycles. I know this for the, those of you that know astrology. Oh, aha. For those that not, it's like, oh, okay. But just realize there are cycles, and that's the glory of astrology, that we can view these. And it's also the complexity. Life is a complexity. So the fact about quintiles, the fact about Venus, Venus we associate with love, and quintiles are metaphysical. They're not a finite structure. It's another embodiment, another layer showing us, indicating to us that this tremendous shift of Uranus going into Venus is really asking us, what is our spiritual value? Not just by itself, not isolating, not fragmenting it, but how do we as people embody that in our sense of measurement? Are we just going to measure, oh, we have five cows like they did way back in the Babylonian days and before? Cows were very important. A lot of the mythology that Rose, June Rose is going to speak of is a time when cows were the primal necessity. They plowed the earth. They were strong. They had the milk. They had the food. You could eat you know, a cow. In so many ways, it was the bedrock. Another word, bedrock. Here we are, Taurus. We're talking about rocks. Is the mineral kingdom. And so, in other words, at that time, cattle was the monetary value. In the North Pacific Northwest, where 1150kknw.com for those that are online and kknwam for those of you that are on your apps. In the Northwest, the Indian culture, 
traded as many cultures, and they traded shells. They had potlucks. Of course, potlucks were more up in Vancouver with the Tinglets Indian tribe. In other words, our sense of value and what we value changes. It's a collective energy of exchange. What is our value? And we will be discussing that, June and I, because there is mythology that's most interesting how it relates. Realizing that mythology, of course, is a language that people had to share relating to their experience. So really, like all languages, it's a matter of interpreting that time. I find mythology fascinating ever since a child. I love language. And I love to see it symbolically. When we start looking at things concretely, that's the entire problem that we're having up until this point. I think this is where the energy is asking us, let's open up. Let's realize how are we embracing that spiritual basis and using it in our senses of the values. Hey, I'm going to introduce June in just a moment. She's on her way. She had a little bit delay. And wouldn't you know that Aranis speaking for us because Aranis is sudden. It is unknown. It's just like Kilauea. Who would have thought there was steam over there? One didn't know. One still doesn't know. But we do know that the sky and earth want a conversation. And it is for us to realize the nature of ourself, to embrace and to look at how we use nature, what's our best ability. And there'll be more of it because we have lots of action. We have the action that we can do with ourselves. Looking at values, which is my last thought, and connecting that energy, values are based on what do they exchange and what can you count on. That's what we have been thinking because we can trust, we think, a home, property, just like those people in Leilani Estates that now are perhaps required to shift their gears 100%. does not look as though Kilauea has any intention of letting go, though we don't know. It's happened before, but time is always new. So where do we put our energies? And this will be where the mythology of the Minotaur comes in. And June and I are going to speak about the Minotaur. There's various astrologers do. Jason Hawley, a wonderful astrologer out of Santa Fe, gave quite a number of speeches about this. And there's an in-depth reading about it. And as you learn more and probe more, and that's the purpose of this show, is to really get into the meaning, at least try to. It's like, okay, this is what people have said, but what is this all about? And question it. Hey, I am going to introduce June. June Rose Trimbach, as I have said, an, an astrologer, and I welcome. Hi, June. Hi, Sue. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be on the show today. Oh, it's most exciting. And I'll just brief you quickly. I have updated people about Uranus and Hawaii and Venus and Taurus. To some extent, we know they're huge, so of course I didn't say everything, but just to give you a little bit of background because I know you had a Iranian adventure getting here which I'm most pleased that you have and I mentioned up at this point when I mentioned about values and really embracing the nature and our spiritual value that you and I have discussed earlier up to this point just touched on there's so much to touch on and finding that value that that doesn't just last because it's already in the form such as so much is measured, but more in the quintile sense of Venus with the earth that is that metaphysical sense. How do we get that real spirit that embodies Taurus? And so it, up until this point, I've made reference to the mythology that you embrace so beautifully in your thoughts and about the Minotaur, which is a long involved subject too, but 
on that basis, thinking that, the, well, you can say as you wish about the Minotaurs, that it, it, perhaps you want to give us a little idea about what the Minotaur myth involves, if you would do that. Yeah, let's talk about it. Um, so, right. like you said, there's so much about uh, this mythical story that we'll touch on what we can, but this story takes place over the course of many lineages, right? So it's not just about the Minotaur as an isolated being, uh, but really this whole lineage, um, really, of these goddesses and these moon goddesses and these women who have this connection uh, to this bull. So the Minotaur kind of comes about uh, because of this king, King Minos, and he is sort of a tyrannical king. And the beginning of the story is when he's still trying to become king, and he is seeking Poseidon's help. And Poseidon is actually in his lineage. Poseidon is something like his great-great-grandfather. And Poseidon um, offers him a white bull. Um, and Minos is supposed to sacrifice the bull. It comes out of the ocean. But Minos, upon seeing the beauty of the bull, decides to keep the bull uh, for himself and put it in his own field. And he sacrifices another in his place. And, of course, this really angers Poseidon. And uh, Minos is actually married to Pasiphae, who is, her name is actually an epithet uh, of Selene, who is the moon goddess, and Pasiphae is deeply connected with the moon. Um, but in this action where Poseidon becomes very angered, Poseidon, and sometimes Aphrodite is involved in this as well, who is Venus herself, right? And as you were saying, Venus is very connected to this. Um, she puts kind of a madness onto Pasiphae, and Pasiphae becomes um, filled with lust and love for the white bull. And the white bull also becomes mad and is kind of rampaging in the countryside. So Pasiphae, um, you know, she comes up with a, a plan to seduce the bull, and she's helped by sort of a mad archetype, architect. Uh, to build a, a fake bull, and she gets inside, and she's able to mate with the bull. And she gives birth to, to a baby, and the child has the head of a minotaur and the body of a man. And she loves this minotaur. There's um, this one, uh, I believe it's a plate, like a Greek plate, where she's uh, nursing the minotaur baby. Um, but, you know, <laughs> sort of other people are very freaked out by this sort of monster and they sort of see it as a monster and they um, Minos ends up consulting an oracle and the oracle tells tells him to lock the minotaur away in the basement and they get the same mad archetype uh, Daedalus to construct this labyrinth and to lock this uh, minotaur away and Minos is also very angry because Around the same time, his son decides to go kill the white bull. Um, but meanwhile, uh, the white bull has been taken away by um, Hercules, who's doing one of his Herculean labors. And he has taken this bull to Athens. So Minos' son goes off to Athens to kill the bull and ends up getting killed instead. And Minos is very angry, and he blames the Athenians. And so he demands that the Athenians offer uh, sacrifices of youths uh, every nine years to the Minotaur. So human sacrifice to the Minotaur. And so it's this very sort of grotesque story, but we don't know exactly um, who to put the blame on. We don't know exactly um, who is really the monster. Is it really the Minotaur? Is it Pasiphae? Is it Minos? So that's just a little beginning. Um, oh, excellent. I love your take on this uh, myth today and I noted a few things because it's very true it's where it was denied this energy of the natural because the minotaur had a head of a bull and the Athens who had really 
divorced themselves, you might say, of all gods that looked like a god of an animal. All their gods looked like people. They wanted to have this civilization of higher thought, which has its glory, but also this fragmentation. And where Crete, where this happened, was really uh, symbolizing more of the uh, nature, you know, that the, that can overwhelm. So it is so much of this energy. How to to uh, utilize and coordinate in this beautiful form. So yes, where where is the blame? In some sense, it's perhaps rooted. Would you say that that uh, King Minas? needed to recognize this gift and not harbor it for himself. Yes, and I think that's one of, you know, one of the core sort of messages about Taurus is this idea of greed or when we try to hold things in, when we try to claim things for ourselves and then it ends up turning into this kind of nastiness, right? It turns into this this thing that, you know, it wasn't what we saw at first. You know, when Minos first saw the bull, it was such a beautiful thing. But by the time all was said and done, he ha- he hated that bull. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm Maybe. sure he did. You know, he killed his son. His his well, wife it, fell in love with it. You know, very good point. And doesn't that show that he had no credit at all to the great spirit, however you put it, of of Zeus, that would have given him this, or Poseidon. Which, who are related, that instead it was all for him, him, him. So, of course, everything went around him. Uh, he could hate, not love, you know, anything. And the name of the Minotaur is Asterius, which means the starry ones. Yes. And that name comes up in the lineage multiple times. Um, Minos's mother, Europa, married the original king of, of Crete, was named Asterius as well. Uh, so the name comes up many times and it's this idea of these moon goddesses being married to the stars and so it's interesting because on the surface this myth looks almost grotesque or it's kind of portrayed that way and then if you kind of dig deeper you see that all of the women involved or most of them are related to the moon goddess and there is this quality of the stars and of this union with the stars Um, and you know through this very physical animal the bull is seen as very virile and and strong and passionate and you know very powerfully um even sexually and it's kind of interesting that it's this bull that's also mixed with the stars and this moon goddess motif with the bull is very ancient and very common and even even celine herself was seen to have horns these the moon was even said to to ride a bull sometimes and, you know, you can find this in astrology because um, Taurus is the exaltation of the moon. So when the moon is moving through Taurus, um, she's the honored guest, right? She's riding on the back of the bull. So my question is, how do we move into this relationship in a way that is natural, as you say, or that is, you know, with Uranus there, it's we're maybe bringing in something more creative and dynamic that maybe... Ha- will have to do some kind of upheaval or awakening or change. Um, but it's a question of how do we become in greater relationship with this this moon goddess who is connected in with this bull, this very earthy, materially physical um, animal. You know, how do we get back into our physical senses and, you know, in, in a liberated way, right? You know, if we're talking about Uranus and trying to bring Uranus into this myth, um, it's that's kind of the question that um, that comes up for me. It's key. It's absolutely key. Absolutely, because Taurus. One reflection here is brought up. Petra, too, from before said it reminded me. It's the fallopian tubes. You know, it's the 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 horns on the top. It's so fertile, and Earth's life at that time. Remembering was total fertility when the rivers flooded. You know, we knew about the moon cycles and and the earth and, and, and the whole process of it. But that's representational. But here, what you're focusing is exactly my interest, too. And I liked what we had spoken of once 
to reintroduce that idea, and that is that through ourself, by recognizing and creating those resources in ourself, that that which we love, that that which we love to do, allows us to use that that connection, that synchronicity of life experiences on, on a not just on a planned schedule, oh, I'm doing this, 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 and projecting, but co-creation that really allows each of us to be as our acorn, as our core, as our true self to, to be. I must say, in, in one minute, I'm going to open the lines out. And so we have, uh, I'll just give this number if anybody has a thought. And it is 888-298-5569. So June, we have another minute. Go ahead, and then I'll give a little more talk about that. Well, in my this minute, I guess I would like to sort of just open up this conversation to dig deeper into Taurus and the fertility of the land and the fertility of our own creation and the conversation that you are referencing. I think we're, we're talking about how we have to be willing to sacrifice to spirit and, you know, like Minos needed to sacrifice this bull and this was the issue This caused all the problems and sacrifice literally means to make sacred. And so we have to think about that in a modern context, right? How can we give back to spirit and offer? And what does that really mean? You know, what does that really mean for each of us as individuals to offer to, to, offer to our world, to our community, to create with the world in this way where we're, we're giving back, we're not holding on and letting things kind of rot inside of us, <laughs> you know, or rot in our own coffers, right? We're... Um, I, I once was told that, you know, a gift unopened spoils in the box. And when we're talking about Taurus, we're talking about the fruits of the earth. And the fruits are either meant to be eaten, you know, or shared. Otherwise, you know, they, they will rot. <laughs> Perfectly said. Blessings. All right. I will announce here on two things. One to our audience. There was a wonderful individual named Brett last week that actually called in and I acknowledge I in error never checked my little notes here if Brett if you choose to call in again we would be most welcome and we do apologize a thousand percent as in Norway you would say Tusen Tak and actually Norway has their Independence Day May 17th coming up which will be most interesting to see how this Ingress, as it's called with Iran, this is going to work with Norway among the entire world. They may have great spiritual lessons. It's such a country focused on nature and already the giving heart. So they might be quite a leader in this, as they always are, what with Nobel Prizes and etc. Meanwhile, folks, please call in that number. It will be open for 15 minutes, 888-298. 5569, you're listening to 11 KKNW. Thank you. While we take a break from this week's edition of Talk Cosmos, let's take a look at this cycle's archetype. We're currently in the period of Taurus. By leaving a cycle based upon initiation, the energy of Taurus integrates spirit into a solid form of matter that is tangible and physical. It's an earth sign, concerned with self-sufficiency and the values to maintain the strength of a life form throughout its survival. Hello, my name is John Talevich. I'm a chiropractic doctor, and you're listening to Talk Cosmos on Alternative Talk 1150 AM where we understand how to implement our free will through the cosmos.
Well, hi again. We're back. And that number again is 888-298-5569. If you have thoughts about what June was speaking of, our values, if you have an astrological question, we have our, we can talk to you about charts too, briefly about the archetype here. And of course, you can always look online at Top Cosmos website to find June Rose Trimbach. If you're just wanting to connect with her for readings or consultations or myself. So hi, June. Hi. I love <laughs> to say I love that you're pronouncing my last name correctly. Oh, good. Yes, I had a little. <laughs> <laughs> I know I had a, a little language there. I like. I like. Yes. So you know. Looking at Uranus and Taurus, you know, truly that connecting body and soul to spirit, because imagination begins that manifestation, your imagination through the heart and the mind and the energy. And as you say, intent manifests that's fruit of it, the length of that energy. So I, the idea of ceremony to intention of awakening to ourself so that we can find out on a personal basis our connection with our own purpose that to me and if somebody wants to call in that's great but meanwhile we're talking Rose and I June Rose and I are talking but I, I love that have you thoughts of how people might connect to themselves yes it feels very much like Connecting with, uh, connecting with nature and maybe even the wildness of nature. You know, there's a moment where I was in the car trying to come here and uh, sort of frustrated at, you know, traffic and life and that kind of thing. And I looked at the trees and there was a moment where I had this memory or this sort of like little vision just of walking through, um, walking through the woods and the maple trees. And then I looked up and there was a beautiful, beautiful hawk flying really low just above the car and it it was just open to a moment of magic and just a very very mundane kind of moment of magic where nothing particularly was happening um but yet you know we can remember ourselves you know in in those moments and in the trees and kind of in the wildness because you know Uranus does also have a very wild side you know it is like lightning and it is you know, it can be kind of like a phoenix or something or just breaking something open so that we reconnect to our natural side and to our bestial sides. You know, but the, the beast is not always, you know, angry or bloodthirsty or something. I mean, it, of course not, right? And so we have to kind of remember both. So ceremonially, I would say, just opening up further, further to nature and further to the plants and the fruits of the earth and there's maybe a piece, too, with um, some of those old mysteries that have to do with, with the death and rebirth that are um, connected with, you know, Ceres, with Demeter. Um, and even Dionysus is involved in those uh, as the kind of vegetation god and like we were talking about. Um, and this this part of Dionysus that also has to do with kind of it is the rebirth of the vegetation, but there's also, you know, the rebirth of the soul. And, um, you know, Dionysus is in connected with those Eleusinian mysteries with Demeter and Persephone. And so Dionysus marries into this family. He marries Ariadne, who's the Minotaur's sister. And that's just an interesting piece. And so there is this thing. And Ariadne also can be equated with a moon goddess. And... So the moon and the vegetation, and, and Dionysus's mother is Samil, and her name actually translates as earth goddess. So there is this link between the moon and the earth and, and rebirth. And so those are the ceremonies that I uh, feel drawn to and called to at this time. Uh, yes. In fact, reminding about this myth, the fact that Ariadne 
who is the sister, as you speak, of a minotaur, is one who leads to the death of her brother with Theseus, who abandoned her before she marries and meets uh, uh, Dionysus because uh, he, he dropped her off on the Kenosis Island where Dion Dionysus is. But the fact is, is that by the death of her brother, it, it is this, it, it was, if I have it correct, or as I understood, this effort to bridge the descent, the conflict between the West and the East. The West was Athens and East was Crete at this time because of this feeding, this, this monster that people would, uh, that was de being denied out of shame, out of all these issues that people harbor, which is so important for the whole element of the myth. And in doing so, it didn't quite cure that. It, the, the symptoms never do the product. It's the cause. And so there is this unity that was necessary. And as Adriadne meets uh, Dionysus, it, it, it evolved into this connection of the spirit with both of their relationships, as we had spoken in earlier conversations, were related to nature and to the body. So the bestial side, if one thinks of what we have in us that we need to let out, that we are not uh, to, to, to recognize, to, and, and in that ceremony as you're speaking of, it is a recycling of that energy. I, I like your uh, rebirth is essential. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if we should tie in some more Uranus themes at this time. Sure. That let's sound? do that. Oh, I love Uranus. Yes. <laughs> so I know you mentioned some of the history of past times that Uranus were in, was in Taurus, but I kind of want to just touch on it again. So we had, you know, the time... Um, leading up to the Revolutionary War in, for the United States and the issues around taxation and who had the money and people wanting the money and wanting the power. And then there is the time period leading up to the Civil War and the issues around slavery and you know, the financial situation with that and who works the land, who owns the land, and who's profiting off of the land. And then, of course, the last time is you know, also a very dark period in human history, but it almost seems like that's all the time in human history. But, um, you know, uh, with Hitler and Nazi Germany, they were expanding their um, territory quite a lot. So we have this issue with land, power, control. And I feel like you can see that in Minos. You can see some of those kind of tendencies in um, in the story with him. And so there's kind of these greater threads where economics are going to be an important theme and also, you know, revolution around these kinds of things. Um, and who is revolting and why is maybe not necessarily clear, but I can see, you know, a lot of issues around um, workers and workers' rights and how much how much they're getting paid and the minimum wage and that sort of thing coming up. Um, but there's all of this. And, you know, each of us as individuals are kind of connected it into this in a certain way. And the way we deal with our own money and value our own skills and the way we share with community or the way we hold on to, you know, if we're trying to hold on to the white bull and possess something that could never really be possessed. Um, so what does it mean to really be grounded into the earth and celebrating the fruits of the earth, celebrating what we have as, as humans, just being able to be alive on this beautiful earth, you know, and how much do we get tied into these kind of larger battles, you know, where we have these kind of Minos-type figures controlling the power 
in the world, you know, and, and where, do we, where do we stand in all of this? So I think there is this theme of, of course, revolution and liberation, and we're all going to see this in our own lives, in our own ways, you know, and it'll mean different things to us. But, you know, again, just opening up that connection to, to what, you know, the joy, you know, and that's part of Venus, and that's part of Venus ruling Taurus, is the joy in the fruits of the earth and opening up into a greater, deeper relationship to that where we're really sort of embodying this, like, radical, you know, it's like radical embodiment, you know, and the radical embodiment of, of values, like, who yes. do we want to be? Do we want to be giving the white bull back to spirit? Or, you know, and I don't mean to create too much of a dichotomy with that myth, but. Um, or to recognize it, just to give credit. It's like you do, that's it, yes. It all brings up, a, speaking of what you're saying, a transformation. I got this out of an article with Jessica Adams, who spoke of Aronis and Taurus. Transformation of rent. Renting, owning, credit cards, paying taxes, paying mortgage, having shares, a pension, all of this, if we think of it as freeing us, that, that restricts us, you know, because Aronis is that liberation, as you, exactly that word. And a key to manage, as she was saying, is keep flexible, keep moving, keep adapting, as we, because we reinvent this world together. Aronis is very much the networker. It's the group. It's of like-minded people. It can have the shadow side of elitism, which I think is what happened with the Athens. They became the elite group, whereas they snubbed the the, the rule, working, uh, land-based. And it's really integrating these. We can look at them in so many ways, symbolically, of their fragmentation. But it is in somehow fashion and the idea of of being part of nature in so many ways we may be forced to you know people might lose their homes in some ways and there is this this struggle between uh reforming our relationship with our financial resources and food and land it's very true yes yes and i think starting you know, more gardening and more sort of alternative gardens or like um, permaculture gardens or community gardens. I think this would be a really beautiful thing. You know, if any of us feel called as Uranus is in Taurus, just moving deeper into that because we're, it feels like, you know, you know, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to say anything too, um, <laughs> too inflammatory right now. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's there. Well, it's there for us to experience. Yeah, I'll rest on your judgment. It's a personal <laughs> basis because I'm like, what, what, what? But I will say I have something in mind that might be a little off, which is fine. I'm ready for it. And that is, is that Finhorn back in the late '60s and '70s when I discovered their book, I was so fascinated. It was a place in Scotland on a very rugged part on the near the shore, where these people uh, met. Um, David Spangler is one of them. He's based out of Seattle, too, outside. I heard him a few years back at East West Books there. And he talks. He has a book on subtle, the subtle energies. But the fact is, is that they went there to really talk to the land. There's this barren little spot, and they ended up with this fabulous garden. Because they talk to the spirits, they talk to the land, to the, to the green spirits. And that's In something. Fact, oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say there was one fascinating incident where they had a rodent. Maybe it was a mole. I don't know, a rat or something, a ground animal. And it was just in their territory. It was messing up all the food. And of course, they realized that what, what can they do? They, you know, with this thought, they're not about to kill it. So the one lady, and I only remember David Spangler's name. Who, but she's a, a prominent feature. Anybody can Google this and find out for themselves. She meditated, which, of course, they all did, and spoke to this animal, which meant she really had to get down into its territory. And she asked it. She told it, you know, this. I know you need food. You can, but 
you take this food and somehow with it, and I don't remember quite the detail, but they may have left food somewhere else for it. In other words, leave our garden here and you may have this. We understand. And hey, it worked. I thought, hmm. I use that with bumblebees when they come in the house and they leave. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And it, it's something that, you know, medicine people all over the globe will talk about is the plant spirits telling them how to use them, teaching them how to use them. And um, that's how we learn as people. Um, so there is something about this. You know, Uranus does have a psychic component because it's that information that comes in in a flash in a split second you know it's it's that s sudden revelation type of energy yeah. and it's definitely possible with the plant spirits I mean you just have to believe the people who've been listening to them and talking to them for their whole lives you know and I think it's a beautiful thing yes yeah, so as you speak of gardening what their take was it that it all starts in the garden, which is so interesting. If you go back to World War II, what helped through that period was were the victory gardens, people planting their own food. Nowadays, there's rooftop gardens, there's hydro gardens. I know in, I read in Seattle, I had mentioned before in another program where they have hydro gardens that homeless uh, are some uh, connection with homeless are are helping to work with through this facility and it might be the uh, million um, there's a there's a name there at any rate the point is and they feed they sell those to restaurants so it's different ways of working these energies but it is that collection around working with the earth that connects people even farming left the matriarchal to the patriarchal that changed so many connections but it had to do with the land working with the land so i think reuniting ourselves to the land has great promise i'm glad you really bring up community gardens right and we don't know what's going to happen to the earth uh, because of climate change you know we don't know we don't know the changes that are going to be happening so if it feels like it might be really important to to start um, getting in touch with the land and remembering again, because a lot of us, you know, would have no idea how to survive um, if no. we were left in the wilderness. And there's a lot of fear around that, and there's a lot of fear, and we might see, you know, shadowy forces in the forest, you know, that aren't really there. Um, and part of that might be part of the Minotaur, you know. And so, reclaiming our our wildness and opening up to that and because there was a period you know people humans we used to have trust with the land you know and many people yeah. on the earth still do but you know um for you know i'm living here you know i've never lived out in any kind of situation like that so you know for people like me i think it's it can be a big step to try to reopen that connection it's very true. And the beginning factor, there's many small steps people can take. And besides the gardening or the collection on that, because there's little towns, there's even places where you can volunteer and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, what was I thinking? Da -da 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 -da. Um, darn. It just well, went in and it went out. Go ahead. I can say something. I've actually been to a Findhorn community sort of by accident. Oh, because I was just for a few hours because um, I was volunteering on the Isle of Iona, the Christian church that was there. And um, I we, we they had a smaller uh, Findhorn community that was like a branch off and it was on this this tidal island. And we went over there and it. Yeah, it was a. Um, I don't know, it was a good experience to get away from the kind of Christian um overlay that I'd been living in and going um, back into this this pagan pagan community and honestly I saw like a goat skull on the top of a you know like a stick marking a sacred area you know mark and they with a with a labyrinth a walking labyrinth right um, so 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 this is the difference right between the labyrinth at Crete which was sort of you know, in the myth, it's meant to hide this minotaur. But so I was, I was 
um, there with this this other kind of labyrinth that's meant as a meditative exercise, right? And then you walk it, and it can be used for divination. So you have a question as you walk it, and the idea is, you know, as you finish it, you might get an answer. And yes, I, go, mm, go oh, ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that um, I was so happy and relieved to be out of the Christian overlay <laughs> that I've been living in for a few months and, and be back at a pagan pagan community just for a few hours where I felt connected connected at back in with who who I really was you know more so and um so this idea of this labyrinth right and um it's yeah I I love that that just came out of that too um but whoops oh <laughs> somebody oh. yes in fact it does remind me it's because we're gearing towards the close here it it is the center the labyrinth of the maze brings you to the center and i remember what i was going to say about this property and that is is that the uh the the oh, i have somebody at the doorbell sorry about this people but anyway we'll let that go um that we are using land without any regard to animals, any regard to nature. That is really, if nothing else, something that on a community level we need to, that also as far as like the gardening and how to work with land and everything that we need to, to work on. So I think we're going to have a brief identification break and then I will say goodbye. Thank you. In Africa, five-year-old Cheru has no choice. She and millions like her must walk miles every day for dirty water. But together, we can end their walk by providing clean water close by. Instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick, girls can be in a classroom that expands their minds, and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses caused by dirty water. At World Vision, care about clean water runs deep. Deep enough to reach one new person with clean water every 10 seconds. Because every child, every person, everywhere deserves clean water and the chance to rise to their full potential. It's true, when you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. Hi, this is Petra Touchard of Petra Touchard Astrology, and you're listening to Talk Cosmos on Alternative Talk 1150 AM, where we discuss the meaningfulness of our roots in the stars. Hi, June. Hi again. Hi. Yeah, we have, yeah, the last five minutes. Well, it is really true. I think Uranus, just as you signified with your story, it breaks the pattern. It is that external planet outside of Saturn, which has a consistency, the four, you know, the four corners of structure of building and, and, and structures, whether it's of, of every type, to this breaking uh, pattern of it has an elliptical uh, orbit, it, it rotates on its side, the axis points to the sun, you know, it's really a, a sudden as you say, awakening and, 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 and change. So there is something, and it brings us to our authentic self, this embracing, you know, past the restrictions into new definitions. Right. So there might be something to say for uh, what happens when you're in the middle of a Uranus transit and your life starts sort of crumbling before your eyes or something like that. And, you know, sometimes it is about, reopening that sense of trust you know with the cosmos but sometimes it's also just about getting through and you know maybe you can somehow find a connection into that deeper um that deeper torian place and that deeper yes. kind of maybe bestial or lunar you know and when i say lunar i mean this this emotional instinctive place 
Yes. And June, we have one minute here. I thank you. You've said it perfectly. I thank you so much, June. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm going to introduce who's next week will be Gemini Brett of More Than Astrology, based out of Seattle, but he travels everywhere. He's an amazing individual, uh, an oracle of his own that speaks the language of stars and beyond, and he knows so much about many, many factors. It's always surprising, and it's wonderful. So that's Gemini Brett. Go to uh, Talk Cosmos to see June. This is June Rose Trimbach of June Rose astrology and she's local in the seattle olympian area and is a wonderful astrologer herself who has really greatly added to this thought about Uranus. so thank you you're listening to 1150 kknw based out of seattle that's we'll see you next week Thank you for listening to Talk Cosmos, the show where Sue Rose Minahan and guests unveil astrology's ancient archetypes that continually build the collective experiences in our unconsciousness. Be sure to tune in next Saturday at 6 p.m. to continue finding your roots in the stars. The preceding audio was via a Skype call.